Okay, Dawn, Peter Merrill just confirming I'm good to go. Yes. Good evening, everyone. This is Dawn. Thank you for joining this webinar brought to you by ASQ Innovation Division. The topic of tonight's webinar is collaboration in a complex world. The majority of people's knowledge is in their minds. Knowledge management recognizes that typically only 20% of an organization's knowledge can be documented. If you combine the knowledge in people's minds for two or more people, you have a powerful combination. Collective knowledge is far more powerful than the knowledge in any one individual or in any manual. Effective collaboration produces this collective knowledge and it starts by understanding the behavior of others. The learning objectives are to provide an understanding of the techniques and competencies need for collaboration, to develop an understanding of complexity and its impact on collaboration. Please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be available on ASQ Innovation Division YouTube channel. Also, there will be five to 10 minute time after the presentation for questions and answers. Please post your questions on the Q&A section of the WebEx tool. Tonight, our presenter is Mr. Peter Merrill. Thank you very much, Peter, for accepting to be our speaker today. Peter Merrill is a keynote speaker on innovation and has keynoted at conferences in cities such as Dubai, Mumbai, and Shanghai. He began his career in R&D and later as chief executive of one of the leading design brands in Europe, he led innovation in one of the most demanding markets. He is an engineer, an artist, and a writer, and is one of the North America's foremost authorities on management systems. He was founding chair of the ASQ Innovation Division and chairs the ASQ Innovation Think Tank. He currently chairs the Canadian National Committee to ISO TC279, the Technical Committee on Innovation Management. He is the author of the books Innovation Generation, Innovation Never Stops, and Do It Right the Second Time. He writes the innovation column for quality progress. Now I would like to hand over to our speaker. Uh, Peter, please take it away. Thanks, Dawn. Well, good evening, everyone. And if you look at history, time and again, you see that successful people collaborate. Going way back, uh, the work of Michelangelo when he developed the artwork in the Sistine Chapel wasn't done on his own. Uh, he had a prime collaborator called Sebastiano, who we never hear about. And he had a team of about 12 people working with him in developing that artwork. Coming closer to the present day, um, there is the story of J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, who were both at Oxford University in the 1930s. And they used to meet in a pub in Oxford every Tuesday evening and share ideas. And the outcome of that was two books that we know too well. Uh, the Lord of the Rings and The Chronicles of Narnia. And both books quite similar, and yet they're distinctly different. Um, right up to the present day, um, if you look at Google, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page show how uh, somebody from Russia and somebody from the US can work together and come up with an amazing new idea. And one last reference, Linus Pauling, uh, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he won his Nobel Prize for uh, his work on chemical bonding. And he attributed his success to better collaboration and not better intellect. And the reason all of these people um, worked so hard on their collaboration was that collaboration creates collective knowledge. And I just want to explain a little more of what we mean by collective knowledge. An everyday example of this is on a race course. Uh, bookmakers on a race course are the experts. And yet, they don't set the odds based on what they, the expert, think. They set the odds based on what the crowd thinks. In other words, where are people placing their bets? They, they operate on what we call the wisdom of crowds. And that is, that is the first indicator of the power of collective knowledge. And we increasingly start to realize that the idea of the lonely genius is a myth. 
we hear of these people in history who take credit for uh, significant outcomes. Uh, uh, people like uh, Thomas Edison, for example. And yet, when you look at the work of Edison, he had a whole team of people working with him at Menlo Park. So we see collected knowledge way more powerful than the knowledge of one person. And in today's world of complexity, collected knowledge has become absolutely vital to solve the problems that we have, the complex problems that we have today. But even then, the knowledge that we have, as we all know, is growing so very, very fast. And this rapid knowledge growth is coming, of course, from digitization. I'm not telling you anything new there. But we do need to recognize that no one person knows it all. And we need to share knowledge, find knowledge that's outside of our own personal box. Problems also are becoming more and more complex. And we know that when knowledge grows as rapidly as this, the lifetime of knowledge shrinks. Um, I, I, I've even heard it said that the half-life of knowledge is 30 days, using the nuclear analogy. Um, we're seeing a rapid change in the marketplace. We're seeing what we might call a perfect storm of change. And a big part of the challenge in finding this collective knowledge is that a lot of it is hidden. If you talk to somebody who's an expert in knowledge management, they'll tell you that less than 20% of the knowledge in an organization can actually be documented. Uh, that's what we call explicit knowledge. And the majority of knowledge, 80% of it, or the tacit and subconscious knowledge, is what we need to mine, to dig down and find. Tacit knowledge is the knowledge we have in our heads, and to subconscious knowledge is the knowledge that we don't even know that we know. And that's the big challenge, finding out the stuff that we don't even realize we know. And the way we do that is a technique called networking, and in particular, open networking. It's often called a knowledge network. It's the way we share knowledge. And also, it's the way we create new knowledge, because what happens with open networking is people spark off each other. You've heard that term, sparking off each other. And that creates new ideas and new knowledge, but it also releases the collective sub subconscious. It's this, what we call, spark of ingenuity. And an open network has at least two degrees of separation. One of the surprises when I first started looking into networking was that I, I learned that more people actually find a job through a friend of a friend than through advertisements. And, um, and that's why networking for jobs has become so very important. The other thing about new knowledge and new ideas is we can't force it along. There's the famous story of Archimedes, uh, who had been tasked by the king to find out whether the king's crown had been adulterated with base metals. And Archimedes worked on that for a long time before he finally got his revelation. And we all know it from our school physics. Uh, how he got in a bath and the water overflowed. But the um, hidden part of that story is that what actually happened was Archimedes relaxed. And that's when some of our best ideas are released, when we relax. So a challenge at the same time is that while we want open networks for collaboration, uh, they are how we gain knowledge, uh, the dispersed or diverse network, as we call it. Those networks tend to automatically close. They morph into closed networks. And closed networks we feel much more comfortable with. Uh, we know people. We understand them. Uh, there's a high level of trust in a closed network. And closed networks are important in terms of getting results. 
Uh, and I'll come back to that later when we uh, look at solving complex problems. But open networks are what we need in the early stages in order to find new ideas. So closed networks are something we've got to look out for. We've got to be careful because you find that in organizations, we tend to get these closed networks forming. And we get this situation where it's about my team winning, not about the organization winning. And we talk about competing with other teams in the organization and not working collectively. Teams can become inward looking and they can actually become unable to collaborate with other teams. But it's so necessary because our own team doesn't have all the knowledge that is needed. And so we need collaboration both inside and outside our organization. And we need to be working with people who we don't normally work with. And I'll explain a little more of that in a moment. There's been some interesting research, though, by a person called Paul Leonardi, which, in which he, he was monitoring um, internal and external communications in the team. He found that if internal ex communication exceeds external communication by a ratio of greater than five to one. In other words, you have m five times more communication internally than externally. You're getting into what we call a silo effect. So that's what you might call an alarm bell that we have to look out for. And if you're on a global team, and many people are these days, there are other challenges as well for collaborators. Um, time of day. I was recently involved in a project uh, with a company that was headquartered in the US but had offices in the UK and also in Japan. And setting up the meetings, the collaborative meetings, was not easy. Uh, the poor people in Japan were working in the middle of the night. so we here could work in the middle of the day. So scheduling is something that if you're working in global teams, you need to give it thought. You need to rotate schedules. You also need to think about culture, behavior, and language, and the different ways that other people work. And uh, not every organization has the same technology across the planet. That can often present challenges. I think one of the biggest challenges, though, is understanding our distant colleagues, the people who are perhaps on the other side of the planet. And we tend to look at purely the technical issues, and we forget the human issues in collaboration. We tend to think of our own team in very positive terms because we know our own people. And we don't know those people at a distance, and so we don't trust them as much. And so we don't, what should we say, trust the information they provide quite so much. So one of the things I'm going to uh, explain is the benefit of developing interpersonal skills in order to collaborate in a better way. So the kind of behaviors that we want to develop in order to release collective knowledge are, first of all, a willingness to explore. You hear the term all the time step out of the box. That's how you gain new learning, new knowledge. But then, when you interact with new people, you need those skills of collaboration. You need to be able to work with people who are different from yourself. And so, exploration, first of all, in a bit more detail, going places, meeting people, um, you met people this week, but ask yourself, were they different from you or was it the same old, same old? And when you do meet new people, do you have an open mind or do you tend to sort of uh, close off what might be challenging new thoughts from the other person? You know, when you're collaborating, look at it as something where you're always learning. Not something where you're telling other people, something where you're learning from other people. And we certainly, well, I use the word learning, we've learned that 
face-to-face -face networking is by far the best. The bandwidth and knowledge transfer is so much greater when we are face-to-face. And I mentioned already that breakthroughs occur at the intersections of bodies of knowledge. And, you know, I've talked about uh, working relationships such as that which uh, Tolkien and Lewis had, but that doesn't come easily. We need to understand the asset that other people bring when we're, when we're setting up a collaboration. If you're setting up a collaboration, you don't do it just because you like somebody. You do it because you both can give each other something. It's an exchange. Uh, the other person may have market knowledge that we don't have. They may have intellectual property. They may have particular tools or technology. All of these things we share with each other. And Stephen Carvey had a, a great saying. He said, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And you know, a lot of other cultures really invest time in understanding each other when they're building collaboration. I do a lot of work in the Middle East, and in their culture, they really invest time in understanding. We tend to want to get straight to the technical issues, uh, whereas if you understand the other people, you build trust, and that helps the flow of information. And you know, cultures between, even between uh, teams in the same organization can be different. And perception is everything. You know, we, uh, we may think we're being uh, very good at attending to detail, whereas other people may see us as being slow and bureaucratic. So a key part of successful collaboration is building trust. But something that is also necessary and can uh, be a bit of a challenge as well is diversity. We've learned that diversity is essential for complex problem solving. We need a mix of people. And you're probably wondering what this picture is all about, this pair of socks. Well, it refers to some research that was carried out by Professor Scott Page at Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And he was researching the relationship between IQ and the ability to solve problems. And he got a, a group of high IQ people, but he needed a control group. So he actually went to the cafeteria and he, he picked a random group of guys. He called them the brown socks group, hence the picture. Uh, they were just ordinary guys, nothing special. What he didn't realize was because they were all different, they had what we call additive knowledge. Each of them had a piece of knowledge the other person did not have. So then he set up the control group and he started work with the Mensa group um, on their ability to solve problems, the same problem being given to the Brown Sox guys as to the Mensa guys. What shocked him was that the Mensa group were repeatedly beaten. And as he researched deeper into it, he found the reason why. It was because the people in the Mensa group all had the same knowledge. They all had the same chunks of knowledge. Whereas the Brown Sox guys had a spread of knowledge. And we, it, 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 it was a real endorsement of the, fa of, of the benefit of diversity when you are dealing with complex problem solving. And diversity at the same time is a challenge. Uh, we don't take to it easily. Uh, we tend to fall into what we call the mirror trap. We tend to be drawn to people similar to ourselves, and that blocks diversity. We like to reinforce what we already believe. And also, diversity creates tension. But, you heard me say earlier, that tension, that spark of ingenuity is what creates new knowledge. Um, just looking at the picture you, you, you see on your screen here, this is one of the groups I've worked with in ISO. And looking at the front row, you've got somebody from Japan, the USA, from China, and then at the back row, uh, Kenya, 
Spain, Colombia, the UK. One of the one of the great benefits of the ISO way of working is the diversity that we bring into our groups. And one of the things we learn uh, when we're working in an ISO working group is how to work with other people. Often, the majority of people in the group do not have English as the first language. And we tend to be blessed by having English as our first language. I know I often get uh, called on to be, in effect, the translator um, or the scribe sometimes when we're trying to document something. Um, but I find it exciting. And I've really got to understand the different cultures and different ways um, of different nations around the, uh, around the planet. So you need to ask yourself, how many people you know who have a different profession from yourself, who have a different kind of job? How many people you know who've got a, a different country of origin? One of the reasons historically that North America has been so good at innovation is because of the diversity over the years. Ask yourself, how many people speak a different native language from yourself? And the other challenge we have in business now is generational. We've now got three or four generations collaborating. And I think we all know that millennials are generally very good at collaborating. But you know, there are tensions between generations. And Gen X and millennials tend to be, uh, there's a friction there. Uh, the boomers tend to be, yeah, they've, they've got softened with the years. They tend to be much more tolerant. Not all of them, though. Um, but millennials are very good at sharing ideas. We need to understand the different backgrounds of the people we work with. We need to understand the um, generational differences as well. So channels of collaboration also have suffered to a large extent. The best way of collaborating is face-to-face. -face. That's when the bandwidth is highest. The most knowledge is transferred. That's why most organizations, when they are dispersed, at least try to come together once a year. In ISO, we do that. We have face-to-face -face meetings a minimum of once a year, ideally twice a year. And in between that, uh, our, our work is done uh, virtually. Uh, either We use Zoom now, um, uh, and obviously a lot of email. As a general principle, try to avoid 100% virtual collaboration. You're going to miss out. You may feel you have no choice, and I know technology is going to deal with it in the future. You know, we're going to have um, virtual meeting rooms uh, in which we feel or believe we're actually sat at the same table as other people. But that's a year or so off yet. Um, also, the thing I've noticed is that generationally people uh, vary on whether they use phone or not. I find over, older people tend to pick up a phone and call somebody. Personally, I never take a phone call unless somebody said they're calling me. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit like the Japanese. I regard that as an intrusion. Uh, why should somebody jump in on my time when it suits them? Uh, I'm very happy to talk to somebody when we've both agreed. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking to a new member of the Technical Committee on Innovation. Uh, uh, we're going to speak at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, she knows I'm going to be calling her. It's all arranged, and we've got our space and time already. I consider that to be a courtesy. Um, texting, uh, a great discipline which uh, ensures being brief. I think we've all taught ourselves to be brief through texting. So that's uh, a, a, a great tool to use. And what you find is that generations have media preferences. Um, Gen X and Gen Y tend to prefer texting. Uh, increasingly, millennials have moved into phone calls. 
Um, we need to understand the other person's preference for collaboration. So I've talked a lot about the uh, theory and experiences of collaboration, but let's just give a moment to think about how do we get started? You know, ask yourself, what is the network that you operate in? Uh, do you, um, uh, I was going to say aggressively, effectively collaborate with your network? Uh, are you networking with people who are different from yourself? I network with people globally. And, you know, uh, I learned a lot from other people on good ways of networking. And when you're doing it globally, sharing uh, knowledge, sharing gifts of value, you see, I call it here. Uh, I might have uh, a technical paper on a particular subject that somebody's interested in, or I've read it and I think, yeah, you know, I think uh, my friends might need to know about this. Um, I've got a, a person in the UK who I have a quarterly phone call in, uh, with. We both work in the field of innovation. Uh, I've got other people um, around the planet that I collaborate with and speak to on a regular basis. So initially, to build your knowledge network, uh, keep it to about five or six people. And over time, you know, you can, you can move on to sharing each other's skills. And that's what takes me into some of the skills we need for collaboration. And I'm going to show you a report that came out uh, four years ago now from the World Economic Forum and points us to the sort of skills that we're likely to need in the years ahead. The report's called The Future of Jobs. And here it lists, it, it, this is just one small part of the report, you can download it from, uh, if you just go on your search engine and just put in WEF, Future of Jobs, you can download a PDF which gives you a whole stack of information. The reason I'm showing you this is that the sort of skills we need uh, after 2020 are very different from the skills we needed back in 2015. One difference, complex problem solving, top of the list both times. So you see why that's uh, clearly still important. But I want to point you to some of the changes. In 2015, creativity was just on the list. In 2020, you can see it's moved up to third place. In 2020, you can also see emotional intelligence has moved on the list. I'm going to be talking about that in a moment. And collaboration is there on the list in 2020. It wasn't on the list in 2015. And critical thinking, which is something most people in the quality profession are good at, is uh, moved, that's moved up the list in 2020. It was there in 2015. My point is, though, if you look at the first six skills in 2020, they're all about, they all come together to enable complex problem solving. We start complex problem solving um, through collaborating. Uh, we collaborate successfully through developing our emotional intelligence. Creativity is a facet of emotional intelligence. And then as we start to converge our thoughts, critical thinking, is the way we arrive at solutions. Um, I'm going to explain all of that uh, in, in the slides that follow, but there's one last thing I want to point you to. You'll notice in 2015, item six, quality control, not even on the list in 2020. That points us to the fact that we are now getting into a very different world. And what used to be called quality control is being dealt with by machine learning, big data, and all of that. So it's going to be important for our future professional success to be mindful of those top six skills that I've shown you on the right. So all of these skills 
Uh, I've just underlined them to show how they all meld together. And I'm going to take you into how they link together. I mentioned already creativity, that's integral with emotional intelligence and essential collaborate. Sorry, emotional intelligence is essential for collaboration. And then when we get to solving problems, critical thinking and creativity are essential skills there for dealing with complexity. Let me tell you a little more about emotional intelligence. Uh, some of you have probably been exposed to it already. A lot of companies are starting to spend time on it and uh, developing this in their people because they realize that it's a prime skill for collaborating. It's about managing our emotions and recognizing that our emotions drive our behavior. And our emotions impact other people, both positively and negatively. Um, if we can manage our emotions, we're going to be able to collaborate so much more successfully. Uh, and, and that's more true when you're under pressure. You know, we can usually manage our emotions in an everyday kind of situation, but when the pressure builds, it becomes much more difficult. And looking at this picture again, you can see uh, a man and a woman have been playing chess together. And um, <laughs> this is actually a very personal story that I'm going to share with you. Um, uh, like most kids, when I was about seven, ten years old, I'd, uh, I, I started to play chess. And I used to play chess with my dad. And then um, he was away uh, one night and... Uh, and I said to my mum, uh, I said, can we play chess, mum? She said, no, I don't play chess. Uh, uh, I said, oh, why is that? She said, well, <laughs> your dad and I, before we were married, we were, you used to play chess regularly, and we had a big argument over a game of chess. <laughs> and we nearly didn't get married. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so this is a man and a woman having played chess and not had an argument. Uh, that's a sign of uh, emotional intelligence. Those of you who play chess know it is a very stressful game. I love the game, but there's a huge tension there. So these are the behaviors that go into emotional intelligence. First of all, empathy. That's understanding what another person feels. But also understanding yourself. So the first couple of items are about feelings, the other person's and your own. Then, curiosity, a willingness to learn. I think most people in the quality profession have that, a willingness to learn, and certainly innovators are curious to learn. They want to learn, find out. Um, tied in with that, and these are very much the innovator's skills now, the toleration of ambiguity. In today's world, things are not always clearly defined. Now, that's a bit of a challenge for a quality professional where we want everything to be precise. The innovator lives in uh, what we call the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous. We've got to be able to live in that world. And all of this comes together in something that you'll have heard about many times in the past, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And... Um, Ultimately, happiness comes from getting success, from achieving things. But I want to move you to the right-hand column now. And some of the personal, uh, should we say, attributes that we need to have. Um, for success, we need to have passion. I think we know that. I always remember years ago somebody saying it's desire, not ability, that leads to success. Optimism, being willing to take the knocks, uh, and if things go wrong, seeing the positive side of things. Both of those things, uh, I'm fortunate in having them. I, I tend to get very enthusiastic about things. And, you know, when things go wrong, I tend to almost automatically see the positive side. Well, what we got out of this was so-and-so. Where I have a tougher time, though, is adaptability. Um, I'm an engineer originally, and as engineers, we tend to be highly focused 
on getting to the end game, getting to the result. And we, t we tend not to be so good at pivoting and changing direction. But that's something I have to work on. And teamwork and being willing to help others, we all know that comes back to collective knowledge and the, how necessary that is for solving com complex problems. Now, all of that is all quite a list. You can develop your emotional intelligence. It's not something you're born with and have to live with. What I suggest you do is go on a web search and, and score yourself. Uh, I would suggest you do two or three different tests I did one recently that took quite a while. It was about 45 minutes, and then at the end of it, they wanted my email address to give me the results. I was a bit upset about that, but yeah, you know, um, it, it's something you should do. And the reason I suggest two or three tests is to find out the correlation. What are the things that come up commonly for you in these tests that you need to work on? Don't try and work on 10 different things. Find two or three areas that you personally feel you need to develop. Um, do you need to be more open to experience? Do you need to be more conscientious? Do you need to be more agreeable with other people? Uh, and it's a very personal thing, but once you know what you have to work on, you find yourself actually continuously working on it I mentioned a moment ago being able to pivot. That is something that I'm constantly challenging myself, uh, being willing to change direction. What might surprise you is that emotional intelligence is twice as important as the STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We all talk about that so much these days. But in the world ahead of us, in the 2020s, uh, it's going to be our ability to work with other people, uh, our ability to be creative and to collaborate that is going to be far more important. And increasingly, the science and technology stuff is going to be taken care of by machine learning and ultimately artificial intelligence. So I keep saying collaboration is essential for solving complex problems. Let me explain what we mean by complexity. Management systems are complex. If you've worked with ISO 9000 or, or one of the management system standards, um, such as the environmental standard or the health and safety standard, you've had experience of complexity. Systems, though, we need to understand as well, not just complexity. And I mean, the work of Deming going way back, uh, he identified that when you're looking at a problem in a process, 90% of the process problems are due to the system in which the process operates. And the definition of a system, and I'm taking this straight, straight from ISO, a system is a set of interrelated and interacting elements. And the critical issue is linkage. The elements are processes, people, and technology. And as soon as you say those three things, you start to see how linkage can be incredibly complex. And we also start to recognize that when a linkage breaks, uh, and it may be a linkage between processes, that's what quality people live with all the time, but it's also maybe a linkage between people and process or people and technology. So that's what we mean by complexity, and that's what we mean by ensuring that we've got good linkage. What happens in a complex system is that cause and effect are, not, are often not adjacent. And in the world of quality, we've tended to look at adjacent cause and effect. The world ahead of us, it's not going to be like that. And in a complex system, a small event at one end of the system can lead to major consequences elsewhere. And um, that is often called the butterfly effect. It was uh, a term that was <clears throat> coined by a person called James Gleick, 
uh, and you'll see at the bottom of the uh, screen here, I'm referencing his book called Chaos. Uh, it was all about chaos theory, written quite a while back, very readable book. And in his first chapter, he's talking about complexity and he says, uh, a butterfly flaps its wings in Singapore and it can lead to a hurricane in the Caribbean. If you look at that in your own business, what it can mean is that somebody in sales misses a requirement or doesn't get it accurately specified, design then works on that, um, on that assumption, and uh, then when it gets to operations, we've got chaos. Another good book uh, linked by Albert Lasser Barry Bassi, uh, a, very, uh, a very readable book again, uh, paperback. Well, both are paperbacks, actually. So <clears throat> to solve complex problems, we need to understand, obviously, what complexity is. Um, and I, I just touched on that. In the time we've got tonight, I can't obviously take you too deeply into that. But I think we all know we tend to focus on individual processes uh, and whether processes are working, whereas in, in fact, you find processes have received a lot of attention. Most of your processes are probably working okay. What we should really focus on is the linkage between our processes. That's where information gets transferred, and problems, more often than not, are due to linkage breaking between processes. And so for complex problem solving, we need two important skill sets, as well as collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. Critical thinking, I find most people in the quality profession have got this. A critical thinking, yes, has an open mind, will question an issue, but essentially these are the steps they go through. Gather all the information, test any assumptions, restructure our thoughts and arrive at conclusions. And this is what you do all the time. This is what quality professionals do. But in our profession, creativity is rather less evident. And we need creativity in order to deal with complexity. And creativity means we find solutions through imagination and being unconventional. And uh, Disney call it imagineering. And that occurs when we have freedom to think, time and space. And we can interact with new stimuli, or as we often say these days, step out of the box. And collective knowledge becomes an important component here. You see the quote at the bottom of this slide, which says, and it's from Albert Einstein. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you a session without a picture of the guy. <laughs> No problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created it. So he was one of the most creative problem solvers that you would ever wish to encounter. So there's a big incentive to restore creativity into your world. We're born creative, but we tend to have it nurtured out by our education. And our daily work takes away the freedom to be creative. I encourage you to find creative opportunities. And it's different for all of us. Some people like the theater. I do a lot of writing. I used to do a lot of painting, but I just don't seem to get the time for it. And I always wish, if I have one regret in life, it's that I didn't spend more time learning to play a musical instrument. I still have my guitar, but uh, I've just never spent the time with it. But creativity is so, so important. Uh, we need it for complex problem solving. And if you, if you doubt what I'm saying here, because it, 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 it's kind of counterintuitive, a lot of research has supported this. Uh, going back nearly 10 years ago, IBM pointed it out in their CEO survey that uh, chief executives wanted more creative people. And more recently, PricewaterhouseCooper came to exactly the same kinds of conclusions. So some of us are involved in global teams. I just want to spend a little uh, bit of time 
looking at what are the issues there. Collaboration in a global environment is not easy, but we have to do it because we're often serving global clients. Um, the advantage of having a global team is that you can leverage knowledge far more and get better experts, and you can get the diversity that I talked about earlier. Um, what you, if you are operating in a global team and you're looking to improve your collaboration, uh, you really need to have well-defined uh, information sharing processes. Don't allow too much on randomness. You certainly need regular team meetings, not something whenever there's a crisis. But here's a twist that I, uh, uh, this is the real message I want to share with you if you're involved in a global team. We tend to just meet on the, uh, on the phone or on the screen and go through the technical, the factual stuff. Remember what I said about seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Share your personal stuff. Understand each other. That's how you build trust. Think about doing a virtual tour of each other's work environment. Use a webcam and a verbal walkthrough. It's going to take you five or ten minutes, no time at all, and yet it gives each other a much better understanding of the other person's workplace. And it makes you feel the other person's workplace as well. And we tend not to do that because we think, oh, well, that's not being efficient. You know, it's wasting valuable time. It's actually leveraging your ability to work together. So summarizing what I've talked through, uh, I started off pointing out to you how famous people in history had collaborated. Michelangelo, uh, Tolkien, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. You know, uh, all of these people learned to work with other people who were different from themselves. And the reason for it is that collective knowledge is something that is so vital in today's world and it comes from collaboration and it's what we need to solve complex problems. You want to try and build diversity into your teams as well. That spark uh, of ingenuity comes from diversity. And I strongly encourage you to look deeper into emotional intelligence because that's going to be a key skill in the future. And it's absolutely critical for your ability to collaborate. And it's integral with creativity. So let me give you uh, just three things that you can work on. Look for opportunities to collaborate if you don't have them already. And think about how you can share things with other people. Do get into assessing your emotional intelligence. And do get into um, developing your own creative ability. Emotional intelligence is a broad scope thing. Pick the two or three items that you can work on. And then with your creativity, find an area that you feel that you can be comfortable with and enjoy. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much again, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A section of the WebEx tool. I should remind you that you can find the recording of this webinar on ASQ Innovation Division YouTube channel. So there is one question that has been posted. Are there any tools you would advise teams to use? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that very clearly. Could you say Can it again? 
Yes. Are there any tools that you would advise teams to use? Any rules? That any tools. Asked? Sorry. Any tools. 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 Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. That was the key word, tools. Yes. Um, okay. Um, I think most of the team tools have been around for a long time. What we haven't paid attention to is the interpersonal team skills. Um, I mean, the team tools are basic things like the meeting agenda, but um, when we get into creative problem solving, uh, I think you want to have a much more relaxed approach uh, to agendas. And I, I, actually, as I, I'm thinking aloud here, one of the tools that I would encourage you to have when you're doing creative problem solving is to have a, a database into which people can put thoughts and ideas. It may be as simple as SharePoint, but a lot of people's ideas come between sessions, not during sessions. So uh, that's, that's one thing that I, I, I think for most people is, is an asset. The other tools that I would look at are what we call ideation tools, idea creation tools, and there are a number of those. Um, and I always encourage people to try several different ideation tools. Um, I mean, the most basic is brainstorming, but people don't do brainstorming very well these days. They tend to, it tends to have slipped from what it used to be. Um, there's a great book, uh, it's been around for a while, called Cracking Creativity. And that gives you a whole list of different ideation tools that you can use. So those, those are where I would focus in terms of team tools. Thank you. So another question is, what EI, Emotional Intelligence Assessment Platform, would you advise? What, sorry? E, what EI Assessment Platform would you advise? What EI Platform would I advise? Yes. Um, I, I'm not going to give you a specific one, to be honest. What I suggest is you simply go to page one of Google uh, well, you just put in on Google or whatever your search engine is, emotional intelligence uh, assessment, and you'll find on page one, uh, two, well, you'll probably find about four or five, and I, I, would just, I would just pick whichever appeals to you. The important thing is to do two or three assessments. Ideally, I would suggest three of them and see what the correlation is. That's really the best way of going about it. Thank you. Another question that is posted is, is the level of understanding or work level an impact? I'm sorry, again, I didn't hear that too clearly. What? Is the level of understanding or work level an impact? No, I'm not, I'm not getting this question, no. Dawn, sorry, no. So, the level of understanding or work level, is that an impact? The level of understanding or what work. was it? Work level. That's the level work. of, yeah, the level of work. That's what I'm saying in the question. The level of understanding and also the work level, is there, like, is this an impact? Yeah, it's the second level word that I cannot uh, hear. Can we spell that? The level of understanding or what? The work, W-O-R-K -O -O level. Oh, work level. Yes. Okay. The, uh, the level of understanding or work level, and then what was the rest of the question? Is it the impact? Oh, okay. I think I understand the question now. Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, uh, I said I think I understand. I'm still struggling with this question because I'm not quite sure what the questioner is getting at on this one. I'm, I'm sorry. 
I'm going to have to pass on that question. Yeah, and let's move on to other questions. Okay. So another question is, where is good place for collaborators to collaborate on collaboration? Okay. Um, I mean, we obviously uh, collaborate in our work environment. What I find is that companies who are serious about innovation have actually set aside space for collaboration. Uh, they call it a lab. Uh, they call it the idea room. And I've seen some very creative environments for doing that. Uh, unusual seating, uh, unusual coloring, uh, and all of it designed to get people to think in an open-minded kind of way. Uh, those are the sort of things that induce creative thinking. Thank you. The other question that is posted is, there, is there a daily practice we can insert to heighten innovation in our communities? Is there a daily package? Is there a daily practice? Uh, I'm not sure. A da did we say daily practice? Pract no. Is there is there a daily practice we can insert to heighten innovation in our communities? Oh, is the word practice uh, or exactly pra yes practice? Oh, is there a daily practice? Okay. All right. So um, what I would suggest is that first of all. You want to find something that's worth working on. Um, you've got to find an area of opportunity uh, if you're going to be, uh, should we say, get a sense of fulfillment. So the innovation process starts with an area of opportunity. Uh, it may be a, a fading product. Uh, it may be just a process internally. Uh, it's probably easier to start with a weak process. What I would suggest, though, is that people meet on a weekly basis, not just sit down once and find the solution, um, that you meet on a weekly basis and you try probably five or six different um, ideation processes, a different one each week. And between each session, you give people an opportunity to record thoughts that they might have had between sessions. Once you get to the end of that five or six week period, then you look at what you've got. And um, quoting Linus Pauling again, he said, the best way to get a good idea is to get lots of ideas. But then you need to sort through them and find which ones worth, are worth pursuing. And you look at all of your ideas based on um, time, cost, and risk. And there's a fourth factor which I'll come to. Um, how quickly are you going to be able to implement the idea? Uh, which is the cheapest to implement? Which is the most likely to succeed? But also, you want to, if you are looking at, uh, at a product, an external uh, deliverable. You want to see which is least um, least easy to copy, because if people can copy your idea, all your hard work is wasted. So that's a, a, a very quick um, a very quick uh, walkthrough of what the innovation process actually looks like. Thank you. Uh, another question is posted, uh, which is, what is a mechanism you use to actively engage people in ideation activities given demands of normal workload? Okay. Um, people actually want to do this. People like ideation activity for two reasons. Um, if you look at the work that's been done on happiness, and a lot of people sort of are cynical about that, but more and more companies are recognizing how important it is, there are two key factors for happiness. One is a sense of achievement, 
and two is meaningful relationships. And that's what ideation gives people. It gives the chance to work with other people, and it also gives us a chance to get some results. So um, uh, I, uh, I would say that engaging people is not the hardest thing. If you give them a meaningful issue to work on, and if you give them a uh, framework and a process to work and take it seriously, people will engage. They'll actually love it. They really do. Thank you. We still have one minute time if you want to post your questions in the Q&A section of the WebEx tool. If there isn't any more questions, we can conclude this webinar event. Oh, there is another question. So how can members of ASQ connect in addition to this, web, to this webinar, I guess, yeah, on how this subject? How can members of ASQ do what? Uh, how can members of ASQ connect in addition to this webinar on this subject? Oh, okay. Um, well, again, on the um, Innovation Division website, uh, there are opportunities to connect, and certainly the Innovation Division is always looking for volunteers. We're just starting work on a body of knowledge, actually. We had a meeting this afternoon in which we were discussing the plans. One of the things we're intending to do is put out a, um, <coughs> a request for volunteers to work on the body of knowledge. So uh, anybody who's interested in participating in that, uh, we'd be delighted to hear from them. Yes. Thank you very much again, Peter, for accepting to be our speaker tonight. And thank you all again for joining this webinar, and have a very good night.